So we're going to begin with chapter 3, which talks about complex numbers. Complex numbers are the first number system that we're really going to spend a lot of time talking about. As I said, the title of the book is Algebraic Structures. You can consider the complex numbers as our first specific algebraic structure that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about. Now, for many, many centuries, there were uh, integers and fractions and real numbers. Actually, of course, the integers naturally came first as people counted on their fingers. Then fractions came along when someone baked the first apple pie and wanted to divide among their seven children, so they had to figure out how to make those divisions and started using fractions. And then real numbers came along when people found out that there were no, were numbers that weren't fractions, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. What happens is each one of these systems, integers, fractions, or rational numbers, and real numbers, it, as you study them, you find out that there are limitations. In particular, there are equations that you can't solve. For instance, this equation, x squared equals 7, you can't solve that if you try to find an x that's a rational number, it's not possible to find a solution to this equation if we restrict x to rational numbers. Similarly, if we have an equation like this, x squared equals minus 1, and we try to find a solution x that's a real number, it turns out you can't do it. Now, why can't you do it? Well, this is going to be our first example of a proof. And uh, here in the text, there's a description of a proof. Uh, it says long drawn out proof. Now what's very important, this is a type of proof called proof by contradiction. Very, very common type of proof in mathematics. Don't know why it's so common. I guess mathematicians are contradictory people. And here's a, a long proof that kind of gives the play, the blow by ball, play by play call. I'm going to go to the second version, which is much more abbreviated. I invite you to read this, which tells you how you're getting the different steps. Uh, but in this case, what you're going to do is you're going to uh, break the situation up into cases. Okay, So uh, let's go back to the statement that we're trying to prove. Minus 1 has no real square root. What that means, it has no real number. There's no real number uh, such that, that that real number squared is equal to minus 1. That's really what this is saying. That's what we mean by a square root. There's no real number which, when squared, gives you minus 1. So let me go to the second proof and see how that works, this proof by contradiction. Okay, remember, what we're trying to prove, we're trying to prove that there is no real number so that such that that square of that number is minus 1. So the proof is by contradiction. Now, when you prove contradiction, what you do is you begin by supposing that what you uh, want to show is not true is in fact true. So you're going to suppose a contradiction to what you want to prove. Okay? We want to prove that there's no real number such that a squared equals minus 1. So let's suppose, on the contrary, that there is a real number such that a squared equals minus 1. And notice this symbol means there exists. Okay. Now, so let's run with that supposition that there is a real number that, that when you square it gives you minus 1. So what can we conclude about that real number? And what we're going to try to do is conclude an impossibility which shows that that real number could not possibly exist. Okay, so there are two cases. Either that real number A that we're supposing to exist, either that real number is non-negative or it's negative. There are only two possible cases. All real numbers are either non-negative or negative. So we're drawing on your knowledge of real numbers that you learned from uh, uh, high school. Okay, so let's look at these two cases separately. The case where A is non-negative first in the case where a is negative second. Okay, in the case where a is non-negative, then if we try to take the square of a, well, the square of a is the same as a times a. So we're taking a non-negative number times a non-negative number. And again, drawing on your knowledge of 
real numbers. We know that when we multiply two non-negative numbers, that's also non-negative. Okay. But we won't. But we want a a squared to be equal to minus one. We said that we chose a such that a squared is equal to minus one. Okay. And the fact that a squared is non-negative contradicts the supposition that a squared equals minus one. Okay, so that means that in case one, we have a contradiction to this supposition. All right, now remember there were two cases, either a is non-negative or a is negative. In the case where a is negative, we're going to multiply two negative numbers together. Now you take a negative times a negative, again drawing on your number of knowledge of real numbers, negative times negative is positive. And this also contradicts the supposition that a squared is equal to minus 1. Okay, so we've been unable to find, basically we've been able to, unable to find a real number whose square is negative. Okay, so uh, we, in either case we contradict the supposition, that means the supposition cannot be true. By contradiction, it follows that minus 1 has no real square root. So that's a proof by contradiction. And I invite you to do these proofs, these similar proofs, using the same sort of method. And here, here's a proof that we'll show that this proof doesn't work, and, and I want you to show at what step the method fails. You can try to do the very same thing, divide up into cases, and find out that there's something that goes wrong when you try to prove this. In fact, minus 4 does have a real cube root, so it, uh, so it should be true that we can't prove this by contradiction. Now, in exercise 4, we run into our first example of what you could call general, generalization. Hopefully you've noticed a pattern from these exercises <coughs> about uh, the powers of numbers becoming a negative number. So here you're given three suppositions and you want to conclude something about one of the numbers supposed here. So conclude, conclude something about n. So hopefully if you look at these, exerc these exercises and the example that's done in the text and see what's going on, maybe you can make a statement about n and and uh, then prove your statement. You can again prove your statement by contradiction. And uh, I think you can have fun with that. Okay. All right, well, let's move on. Okay. Now, exercise five is intended to point out the di distinction between a graphical aid and a mathematical proof. Here you're supposed to sketch a function. You've seen functions like this before. And from this function you can deduce something in the same way you've done in high school and college algebra. Uh, but we would not really call this deduction a proof because you're simply looking at, at a graph and making and drawing conclusions. Uh, now, what we want you to do in this exercise is to actually prove the statement that you deduct up here. And I can say the, the proof of this is very similar to the previous proofs in, in the text. Okay. And we want you to do the same thing with this, with this uh, function as well. And there are other fun exercises for you to play around with here as well. Now, so far we've demonstrated that there is no real number that is equal to the square root of minus 1. And that's fine. And for many years, uh, people, mathematicians, were happy with that. But unfortunately, a square root of minus 1 kept popping up. You can read this, this uh, account of uh, Bombelli. And... Uh, it turns out that mathematicians could no longer ignore the fact that the square root of minus 1 is useful in some contexts. So they went ahead, what they went ahead and did was just create a number that they called the square root of minus 1. Now, you might think this is somewhat arbitrary, but it's not unprecedented. Actually, that's the same way that they created the square root of 2. 
uh, they found that the hypotenuse of a, of a 45-45-90 triangle uh, was not a rational number, so they had to call it something, so they called it the square root of 2. And we can calculate square root of 2, and you'll see later on that we use square root of minus 1 in many, many, many calculations, especially in engineering. Okay. So we call this number square root of minus 1, we call it i. I think Euler was the first person to do that. And what we do is we extend the real numbers to include this number i. So we take the, uh, the real numbers, a, represented here by a, plus another real number times i. So the arbitrary complex number can be written as a linear combination of a real number plus another real number times i. Now if you've seen vectors before, this looks like the sum of vectors. So it's not an unfamiliar operation. Right? So here we defined a new set of numbers, a new number system, or what I've called a new algebraic structure, which I call the complex numbers. And we're going to have to do properties. Now we need to be careful because complex numbers look similar to real numbers, but so far there are many properties that we haven't proven about complex numbers. We can't assume that complex numbers have the same properties as real numbers. Okay, so we talk about here the structure of complex numbers. This 5.387, that's the real part. The minus 6.432, that's the imaginary part. And here's some exercises to get you familiar with complex numbers. Okay, so here I backtrack a little bit in this section and talk about how complex numbers were not the first time that the a discovery forced a revision of the number si of the existing number systems. And I alluded to this fact that the Greeks discovered that if you have a 45, 45, 90 triangle uh, and the, you have uh, the legs are one and you want to get the hypotenuse, they fully expected that there was a rational number here because they knew rational numbers. They expected there was a rational number that was equal to the hypotenuse. And there was a shock to them to find out that there is no rational number which is equal to this hypotenuse. And you can go through and read this proof. It has a, it's a similar flavor to the proof that there's no real square root of minus 1. The proof is by contradiction. Again, we're going to be using properties of rational numbers that people are familiar with. So I invite you to go ahead and read this proof yourself. and try to follow the argument. Uh, that's a uh, mathematical skill that you need to develop is be able to read a proof and understand the, the guts or the, the, the feeling behind the proof. And by the time you reach the end of this proof, you'll, you'll have discovered that the number x here, which labels this hypotenuse, there is no possible rational number that can be the hypotenuse here. Now, we, uh, what the Greeks did was they just went ahead and used a symbol, this radical 2, to denote the hypotenuse. Just in the same way that Euler used the letter i to denote the square root of minus 1. This is a definition of that hypotenuse. Now, since that hypotenuse is not a rational number, we've proven that this, in fact, is some kind of irrational number. Okay. Here in these exercises, we ask you to use some similar techniques to prove, uh, to prove some similar statements. And once you understand this proof, you can prove all kinds of things are irrational, square root of 3 and so on. Okay, so here's some exercises uh, how, that you can use similar techniques. And this is also a very important realization in mathematics, is that once you have some kind of breakthrough and you understand what you're doing, this gives you a tool to do other things as well. So not just square root of 2, but cube root of 2, nth root of 2, if n is positive integer greater than 1. Uh, you can prove several things here using similar techniques. I should also mention that this proof uses some facts about prime numbers, which you know from high school, but in fact are not quite so easy to prove. You can say that proof is like uh, the layers of an onion. Uh, you prove in, in one way, and then in order to get a more rigorous, more fundamental proof, you may have to go back and revise your proof 
uh, to and prove some of the assumptions that you used in the proof. And we'll see this as we go along in the in the chapter. Okay. So the point in this section was that in the same way that the square root of 2 showed that rational numbers is not enough. So the square root of minus 1 shows that the real numbers is not, not enough in many contexts. And again, we'll see applications later where the square root of